Good morning, happy Friday, world, and everyone on the internets watching me. This is Reaper Pro Tips with your host, Anne, and disembodied voice, Justin. And boy, is it just an inefficient day. Like, today has been an extremely inefficient day for me. It's not a bad day, it's just not efficient. Like, it's bleeding time out its, like, both ears. Like, that's all. It's just like, you know, you, you look up and you're like, how did it get to be that time? Mindfulness, uh, I definitely need my meditation today. <laughs> I need to like be like the whole, no, no, we're in the present moment, ohm. <laughs> I don't actually ohm when I meditate. How are you doing, guys? I see lots of people. Inefficient Friday. Yeah, hashtag inefficient Friday. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I think that Friday at Reaper tended to be this way anyway. Like, I, I remember Friday being a very inefficient day at Reaper. Like, you know, where you just come to work and you're just like, well, I'm not getting jack done today, <laughs> you know, just because stuff happened. And you'd be like, I guess Monday. <laughs> yeah, I think it's an inefficient day. I don't mind having... I don't like the polarization of good day and bad day. I like to have like a variety of dayness. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a shades of gray kind of person in almost every respect. Um, so I try not to polarize myself ever. So good and bad days are like that. It's a very inefficient day. Like some days are very unskillful days. <laughs> the days where you just cannot like hold something in your hand for longer than two seconds without dropping it. Those are very in unskillful days. But today is an inefficient day. Uh... Uh, you have, uh, you have, you have a Justin. Yeah, we haven't had Collins for eons, Twisted Oma. Eons. Like, eons. We've been on here for eons, I swear. Hello. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, I, I did manage to start and con I've only missed a single day of my meditation practice, I would have you know, since the first of the year. I will say next uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, though, uh, you guys will have either Collins or John. Because <gasps> Justin is gone? Correct. I will be in Aspen. Oh, you'll be skiing. Look at him, guys. David is is uh, like David is not here, but he would be very, very jealous um, were he here. Do you hear that? You're the second uh, person, we friend we have, who is essentially going skiing and making David jealous. There's just no good day, trip, day <laughs> trips. Yeah, there's no uh, no good day trips from right in the Bay Area. Like, you can get to mountains in, like, four hours, you know, in, in snowy conditions. You know, you can get to skiing in four hours, but that's not a day trip for David, you know. And he kind of wants to, during COVID, he'd rather just drive out, ski for a day, and drive back. And you just can't do it if it's a four-hour drive. So That's fair. Yeah, he doesn't, he's uneasy about staying in hotels and stuff. But, uh, but we did have a friend offer to put us up at his place for skiing. So we're thinking about maybe taking a weekend trip. So we'll see. I haven't skied in ages, so I'd be sure to fall on my snout. Yeah, see? Daffodur, exactly. See, I used to ski when I was younger. When I was in uh, high school, my parents used to take us just to... And it was Wisconsin, so it was hills. It was not, like, real mountains. But I did ski on real mountains once and during college. We went out to Big Sky in Montana. Um, so that was an experience, but I, I am prone to like, you know, definitely falling over like, but I usually make it most of the day without falling over more than a couple times. So as long as I stay to the easy stuff, I'm, I was, I used to be okay, but like, it's been 20 years since I skied because there's nowhere in Texas, right? You have to fly, fly to somewhere to ski. I think, I think, uh, Taos is the closest place of driving and that's like eight and a half hours away, nine hours away. So didn't take long to get it back. Oh, that's good, Dragon Eye. Good, good, good. I would just like to kind of retrain. Like, I feel like my initial instruction in skiing was pretty shoddy and simple. Like, I remember it being shoddy and simple because it was at some, some Wisconsin ski hill. Um, so I would kind of like to go get, like, properly taught <laughs> by, by, like, an instructor who knows his crap so that I could, like, you know, maybe, maybe be a little bit better, come out of it a little bit better with a better start, right? Taos, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, David and I drove up to Taos last year, February, when we went to Santa Fe, when I had to drop off models. Um, I like, I really like Taos. 
All right, guys. So today we have a Dark Dwarf Smiter. He wants to smite you. And uh, he wants to know what metallics you want him painted in. This is the most important question. Um, so, oh, yeah. Yeah, stretching. Yep. I'm just trying to work on my back these days so that it's not tweaking at me. I want my back to be pretty happy before I go to, like, ski because, like, you need all that core strength for skiing, so... Um, so, all right, wait, here, here, we're gonna, this is what we're gonna do, because, yes, yesterday Val shouted out red, and I was like, what are you thinking, Val? And then I realized I might not even have red, so what I'm gonna do is I, I don't have all the metallics, guys, so I'm gonna show you the metallics I have, and you can choose, and I think red is one of them, although I personally feel that, like, doing ruby red is not, like, that exciting, but we could, we could do it, so hold on, let me lay these out. And I'm mostly going to be picking my darker, like, mid-tone type things, because that's where you start. Let's see here. Ancient bronze. I'm just going to see what I have, because I do not have everything. I do not have everything. So, let's see here. We got some tarnished brass, old bronze. I pretty much grabbed kind of a lot of mid-tone metallics and dark metallics, because, uh, Light metallics are for uh, highlighting. All right, so what do we got here? We got gunmetal blue. We're going to need that no matter what we do. Um, adamantium, adamantium would be boring, so I'm going to remove adamantium from the equation. And that. Silver is like, silver stuff is, is seal is so easy. So, all right here. So I do not have um, amethyst or, or any of the weird colored metallics except for ruby. So we have to go with what Anne actually owns. Oh, I do actually have gunmetal blue, so that's different because I love it. Um, scorched metal, but gunmetal is also one of those colors. That's very easy. Scorched metal, old bronze. And I do have, uh, there we go. I don't know where my dragon gold went. I had dragon gold. But anyway, this is like Anne's, since I don't use metallics very often, this is kind of Anne's MVP list of metallics. Well, but metallics, see, I think metallics are not hard at all, Twistedoma. Metallics are, are a lot easier than NMM because they kind of cover your butt because you don't have to place all the highlights and shadows necessarily. Um, black and steel is very easy custom toys. I mean, black and steel, you just highlight with a lighter steel. Like, super easy, right? Um, we're not painting the whole mini Fido in metallics, but he is a very, if you look at him, he's a dark dwarf, so he is covered in metal. I chose this specifically because people said they kept seeing me do NMM and they never saw me do metallics. So I specifically chose a model with big chunky armor, which is the best place to do metallics. You don't want to do fine or detailed or filigree armor with metallics. It just doesn't work very well. In my opinion, I think NMM always will look better on something with tiny details. Um... So yeah, but we still have to, we will have to choose a skin color, and I'm okay choosing the skin color uh, after we figure out what metallic we want to use. So I'm seeing a lot of bronze or copper or scorched metal, which could go either way. I'm seeing some red. Animantine, I removed from the, I removed from the consideration Shadow Raven, because black metallic is super easy. You just edge it with silver. It's like... It's not, you know, it's... Okay, you could technically use adamantium, with a, um, with any other color, like you could use it as a shadow for any other color, but I tend to shade my metallics with regular paint, like Michael Proctor does, because if a, if a metallic is dark, it won't be shining. So you shouldn't use a shiny color in the, in the bottom. Uh, but yay, the sun! I'm seeing scorched metal, coppery orange. Let's play around. The masses have spoken. Looks like you guys want to go reddish rather than greenish, so old bronze is out. You don't want to go blue, so gunmetal is out. Um, and I'm going to keep ancient bronze and dwarven gold around. We'll see. Dwarven gold is like, okay, so here's, here's the secret, guys. Depending on which flake you like, dwarven gold is very close to a, a good copper color. 
Coppery orange is on the right. Dwar Dwarven gold is on the left. Dwarven gold is a very red gold. It's just got going to have a more of a gold highlight to it. But they are very similar colors. And if you mixed a little bit more red into this, you would get a great copper. So keep in mind that Dwarven gold can also be used that way. Um, keep all those guys out. And then I'm going to grab my bag and grab out some highlights. Oh, you're so mean, Twisted Oma. So, okay, so now we need to choose a highlight for this. Is that my dragon gold? No, it's antique gold. Why do I not have dragon gold? Weird, dragon gold is one of those, like, kind of core colors. Mm, guess I have to put that on my list of things. List of things to order from Reaper. Dragon gold. But it's all right. For highlights on gold, technically, I always use new gold. But we are not using, we are not doing highlights on gold today. We are doing copper, which is different. Very different. All right. Hmm. Okay, I think we're good. The only highlight color we need with these guys is that. And I'm going to play with both of these, both Dwarven Gold and Coppery Orange, because now that I've noticed the similarity, I'm very curious as to what I can do with it. Uh, it's not a never-ending list, because I do have a lot of paint. And the other thing, custom toys, is that I mix a lot. So I need... But at certain colors, it's like I can't I can't mix that color, so I need it. And Dragon Gold is one of those. It uses the same new flake as Dwarven Gold. Most of the metallics and bones are new technology. Um, new flake technology. But, it, uh, but it's brighter. So it makes a better highlighter for stuff. So if you started with Dwarven, you could technically highlight it with Dragon. Things like that. Um... Although I use regular paint in my shadows often, uh, I do use metallics to highlight metallics because you do want, the highlights must be shiny. I mean, think about metal, right? If it's turned away from the light, it's dark. Uh, and in a shadow, it, like in a deep crease or something, you won't see any light. But when you are in the light, you do want it to be shiny. So at that point, you do use a metallic to highlight your metallic. So, all right. So we're going to use a copper. Technically, if we started with scorched, we could uh, ignore putting a base coat under it because scorched metal has excellent coverage. So almost all metallics, you want to paint a color down first, like an actual opaque normal paint color. For reds and golds and bronzes, you usually want a dark brown or a dark green, maybe even a dark red, depending on what you're going for. For, uh, for silvers and steels, you want a dark gray or even black. I think black is a little bit much for me. I tend to go for a dark gray. Um, but either way, you want to, in almost all circumstances, you want to put down a normal coat of paint before you put down your shiny coat. And the reason is that metallics are made to be more reflective and shiny over a darker color. Um, this is something the manufacturer of today's metallic flake uh, is very uh, transparent about. When they sell us the flake, they tell us, they show us examples of how the, how the flake looks over white and over black. And so they are actually made to do that. They are made to go over a base coat of darker color uh, to, for, for maximum shiny results. If you're looking for a more subtle shiny result, then put them over a lighter color. But most people want their metallics to be shiny. So shiny. So lots of, uh, hello, shuttle stop. How's it going? Yeah, so essentially if I was using only scorched metal, then I would, uh, I could start with just that because scorched metal and like gunmetal blue and adamantium have a lot of solid black pigment in them already. And that tends to make them cover. So that'd be the, that'd be the thing. But when we're doing our copper, then we want to lay down probably a dark brown. I would, I'm guessing like black and brown or russet brown would be good. Yeah, if you Zenith your minis, put down a... Yes, definitely. I mean, if you're doing your Zenith just to know where your highlights are anyway, then yeah. Yeah, I mean, just paint it black and put your metallics where you will. Um, all right, so that said, I need uh, my colors to go down on... So black and brown. It's a nice dark chocolate color. It should give a really good uh, dark base. The other thing you're going to notice is uh, when you put down a color underneath your, your metallics, they should not go streaky. They should actually go um, a lot nicer over that surface. So, right. Yeah, they're actually made to do that. Like, the, 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 that's, that's how the flakes work. <laughs> um, so, yeah, excellent. All right, let's see here. So we need to figure out how we're going to break this guy up. 
granny glasses online. So we've got, we've got a breastplate and we've got arm plates. Ooh, I totally didn't miss that mold line. What was wrong with me? Well, while we remove mold lines, it's a good time to plan our colors. I do this actually regularly. When I'm cleaning a model, I'll be thinking about it and noticing the various uh, parts and pieces. So this is a very realistic Anne model, sitting here figuring out color scheme while we clean off the mold lines. And I'm just using an X-Acto knife because this is bones black. So scraping with an X-Acto is a perfectly valid way to get your mold lines off. And then using my fingernail to kind of pull off bits that are hanging or to nick them off. So we have, um, we have a breastplate, but it doesn't take up very much room. We have layered shoulder plates. Uh, looks like we've got some cloth here on the arm. Got wrist guards and the hands are metal. So that's all metal. So really have a little bit of cloth in here, which we'll probably go black with because it's just, you know, uh, favorite round of the reddish hue is going to be ruddy leather. 9109. Which is different from my favorite red with a brownish hue, which would be 9070. Alrighty, so, and then we've got a belt and layered plates going down, all the way down. Looks like almost no, like, there's a boot here and a strap here. So there's a little bit of maybe non-metallic stuff here, which will probably go dark brown anyway, so I should just paint it with the, uh, the black and brown. We have some manacles back here, which is fun. We could do those in a contrasting metal color. We have a little um, dark dwarf symbol back here. Likewise, the spikes um, driven through the uh, steel. We have skull factor. Skull factor, very important. As any Games Workshop player will tell you. All right, I'm going to actually take off this mold line also. I just want to make sure I'm starting fairly cleanly with this. Don't want to have to take off. Metallics are colors that tend to skin and make layers. So, um, whereas with regular paint, I, I'm pretty fearless about, oh, I missed a mold line. I'm just going to take it off and then paint over it. Metallics, um, because of the flake, do build up thick enough to leave layers. Therefore, I want to make sure all of my mold lines are gone before we start this endeavor. Because I'm not going to be able to just do my trick where I just like paint over it necessarily. I, I might be able to, but do I really want to take that chance? No, I don't. Hmm. All right. Got to take the edge off of this. And this looks like a bit of cloth. Looks like there's a little bit of, the, maybe that cloth is there and there. There's a little bit of loincloth or, or cloth underneath this metal. So we might go red with it. Depending on what our colors are looking like. I'm just trying to get that mold line off of that bottom edge there, guys. All right, that's pretty good. His beard's really roughly sculpted, so... Uh... Well, I have to figure out what to do with that. A lot of times with 3D, um, the hair is hair is really hard to sculpt for 3D. So what I will do, guys, when you get a, a when you get hair that's sculpted like this with sharp peaks almost. Often I will take my knife and I will round those off to make them easier to paint. Because otherwise painting when it's such a sharp peak is really difficult unless you're just dry brushing. And I'm never dry brushing. So if you're trying to do a nicer paint job and you notice that the model has hair that's sculpted really triangularly, just take your knife and flatten those out. That way it'll save you a little bit of headache down the road. You'll have a little more room to play and suggest strands so that the hair will have a chance to look more natural. Now, if you were going to paint this guy like a WoW, like a World of Warcraft Dark Iron Dwarf or Dark, uh, the really the nasty ones, you know, the ones who are actually metallic, then you would keep your sharp peaks on there because you would be painting it as if it were metal, essentially sculpted in metal. But if you're trying to make this guy look alive... then I would flatten these out. Try not to leave any like real big artifacts of your knifery. 
if you can. There. Hair is one of the hardest things to sculpt realistically. Hair and fur, some of the hardest things to sculpt realistically in 3D. So there's a reason why sculptors tend to go this route, but it, it, it is hard to paint it naturally. So that's why I'm taking this down. Taking this texture down a notch, making it a little bit easier, hopefully, to blend it in. Uh, zealot because it leaves a it leaves a texture. Dry brushing, okay, one thing it ruins your brush because you have to have the paint really dry on your brush, and so you're beating up your brush when you're doing that texture thing. Um, two is that it leaves a texture that I don't like. If I want texture, I'll put it in, but I don't want a random texture most of the time. Uh, dry brushing, the problem with dry brushing zealot is that. Uh, it was created for like specific purposes. Like it was created for like terrain or to put texture on like, if you have a high texture surface, like gravel or really fine fur, you can get some really good mileage out of dry brushing. But then it was adopted a general as a general way of highlighting uh, quickly, which is great if you're doing gaming paint jobs, but I never am. And so because I'm never like painting quick and dirty, if I'm going to paint something for the game table, I want it to look good. Um, so I never use dry brushing because to me it, it looks bad. Um, it's a technique that's meant to be fast, not good. Um, that said, there are people who are good enough at dry brushing to really make it look good, but they spend a lot of time at it. Like, like with, with painting time equals better usually. Um, and the guy I knew who painted his lizard man army with dry brushing and washes and had it look phenomenal, like spent a lot of time dry brushing in successive, really fine layers. He was really good at it. But he was one of the few people that I knew that could do that with dry brushing. And even then, it took him a while. Um, so dry brushing definitely has a place with highly painting highly textured surfaces. Um, even And it also has a good place in weathering. Like people who paint tanks uh, and and like uh, car, car models to a really high standard or planes, they'll use... Uh, dry brushing with like powders and with or with like really really dried paint to create dirt and mud and you know and, and dust texture that's really fine and that's actually a really good use for dry brushing but you again you have to be pretty good to get that to look good right you have to practice a lot with it so dry brushing itself is great if you're trying to paint fast for the game table but if you're trying to get better at painting you usually want a more precision technique that isn't going to wreck your brush so Long answer. <laughs> but the, actually, the funny thing is, because I was self-taught, I was never taught to dry brush. Like, I learned dry brushing after I learned layering. So I learned dry brushing after I could already put together a blend. So I am, um, you know, I just kind of look at it for me, because you always have to assess these techniques and ask yourself whether you're happy with them. That's the key here, uh, Zealot. Like, like, is this, is, am I happy with this result? And if the answer is yes, use whatever, use that technique. Like, seriously, just because I don't like dry brushing doesn't mean you can't like dry brushing. Go ahead, go for it. But that's the reason, those are the reasons that I don't like it. Because I tend to like really tight, clean paint jobs. And dry brushing gives me um, a texture that is not clean. It's a dirty texture. That's why they use it for weathering, for dirt. Yeah, but it's what people do now. I mean, it's it's fast, right? Especially if you use it in combination with washes, which kind of smooths out the texture, you can get decent enough results for the game table. I mean, if I was if I was a GM who had to paint all my monsters for every session every week, I would probably do it. Because I'd I'd be desperate. I'd be like, "Oh my gosh, I have to get this model looking decent." But uh but I don't even do it with my like when I was playing miniatures war games, I never used it on my models. I just took a lot longer to paint my army because I wanted to have something that I was happy with. Alrighty, so now we've got all our mold lines and we've got our beard kind of taken down a little bit. Um, and I think I think we've got almost all our mold lines here. And uh, here's our last one. At least our last one we're gonna bother with. So I'm thinking, hmm. I'm thinking maybe alternating layers 
of dark and light or do i want to do do you want to do the all the armor and copper or do you want to alternate it with dark and light coppery color yeah rust effects war shadow exactly weathering effects it's really good for that Although even then, I, I do rust with stippling usually. I prefer precision. Because if you want rust, if you really look at rust war shadow, rust appears in specific places on models. So dry brushing won't necessarily get you the the, the a realistic rust effect. Depends on, you know, what you're working on, obviously. Yeah, that's true, Royal Llama. If you, especially if you're starting, like uh, over time, you shouldn't need that because uh, when you do your dry brushing, like, yeah, it will pick out your outer surfaces, but over time you should come to understand, you know, by doing that, you come to understand where your highlights go. So you should be able to drop out that step. The other thing about that is that it's what I call, it's the gaming highlighting style, which is a total, which is a different style from the overhead lighting style. So there's two different styles in America and the one grew up, I, I used to call it the games workshop style, but technically it's gaming in general. And it's the way I learned in the back in the beginning, which is you highlight everything that sticks out. And so that's the kind of highlighting style that doing the dry brushing trick will give you, right? Cause it'll, it'll hit everything that stands out and then you highlight there. Um, the, but that has made it harder for me to understand overhead lighting, which is the more realistic form of lighting where you're actually thinking about light coming from above or from a direction on the model. And that sort of thinking is what you need to do like non-metallic metal and, uh, uh, glowing objects and stuff like that. So essentially starting out with that, that highlight everything that sticks out technique actually made it much harder for me to understand lighting later on and to apply things like glowing objects, or, uh, other source lighting, lighting lighting moving in a direction, non-metallic metal, made it all of that harder for me because I had to unthink of the way I had been highlighting things for so long. So do be aware, like, yes, you can use that, but be aware there are a couple of different like highlighting tricks out there, like different highlighting mindsets. And so when you commit to one, then you've got to learn the second one and it can be harder to do it in that order from the highlight everything that sticks out to the actually trying to figure out how light falls. So you get fine results with both. You'll get very nice looking miniatures with both. It's just the one is a little bit more cartoon and the other is more realistic. So it, it's your style at that point. Um, dry brushing will not make you good at skin. Zealot. Ever. Like... I, I don't think that you could ever, you'll never get really good at skin. And the reason is the skin is smooth. So any texture on the skin will make it not look right. Um, so dry brushing also is very fine features, right? It's tiny little details. And that's what dry brushing really stinks at is like picking out like precise little details on a face. So that is, that is one of the problems. Hey Crowley. 15 months. Yeah, that's the problem I had with the two VCRs. It's very hard to control. Now, some people are really good at it. Like I said, there are people who do amazing stuff with dry brushing, but you got to actually become a pro at dry brushing to get there, right? It's like, no matter what you're looking at in the hobby, if you want amazing looking models, you're going to have to like really, you know, spend some time and effort to master the technique. So there is no quick and, quick and dirty way to get really, really good. It involves time and care. Doesn't involve as much time as you think. If you're, if you're paying attention, it's a mindset thing. Alrighty. I'm trying to figure out what, how light and how dark we want to take this guy. So what do you guys think? Do we want to go lighter with the layered plates and darker with just the bigger plates? Do we want to go alternating with the plates? Yeah. And that's the other thing is that there's definitely a getting good at dry brushing curve, right? I hear you green side. Yeah, Proctor's Shaded Metallics, right. See, and that's where dry brushing again falls down is the precision. And also putting weathering where it actually would be on the model, not just all over the place. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he did. And, and he had the advantage of, since that entire piece of metal was rusted, he could just, you know, start with a rust color and move up from there. He didn't really have to pay much attention to where the rust would be because it's been sitting in the ocean. It's a piece of metal that's been sitting in the ocean. It's going to be rust all over. Um, alternating, alternating. All right, let's rock that. Let's go. 
So let's first put on a dark layer over the whole, all the metal. And even the boots, probably. Although this is our opportunity to uh, kind of make sure that we remember. Oh, that's right. I dug out my old mixing brush so I don't have to brutalize my regular brushes anymore. Although my Raphael's are now um, heaving a sigh of relief. So I'm going to put one drop. I'm probably about six to one on this. I did wash this bones model, so six to one. A little bit of water in the paint should just make it go smoother and not impair um, coverage that much. I'll get down, Pendrake. Hold on, let me get closer. And then we'll get in focus. So overlapping plates here on the shoulders, overlapping plates down here. So what I'll do probably is I'll start with actually a dark center because the detail is the important part. And having a dark breastplate will, if we decide to go like a light or bright color with the beard, will make it stand out. So let's get my mixing brush over here and grab our happy little good brush. But yeah, the trick with rust is, I mean, and I, I tell this story, I've, I've told this story before, but there years ago I was judging at Origins um, and a lady had her orc army or an orc unit and the whole thing was slathered with brown. Like it was a yellow, uh, a yellow paint scheme, but it was just slathered all over with this dirty brown. So she didn't, um, you know, she didn't place very high. And afterwards, she came to the to me to complain and ask why she didn't why she didn't place higher because she'd put so much work into them. Um, and I was like, well, it was kind of this, you know, because me and the judging team had gone together and gone, well, what's this? All this dirty brown all over the model. Well, that's oil stains. And it's like, oh, we just thought it was a really dirty wash. And the reason that it didn't carry as oil stains, and the moral of the story is also about rust and stuff, is that it was everywhere. It wasn't targeted. When you look at oil leaks and oil stains on real machinery, they come from specific places and they go and drip down in specific places. So when you just put your effect over everything, it doesn't look as realistic. And sometimes it can just be assumed that, oh, you just messed up. So... That's something to keep in mind. I'm going to put this dark brown over all the metal because even though we're going to be alternating light and dark copper, copper E colors, um, we still want that dark brown base coat under all our metals. Technically, the scorched metal doesn't need it, but there's no reason not to do it. Like it would, At this point, it would take more time for me to specifically paint certain pieces of metal and not paint others than it would to just paint the whole darn thing. Well, like if you're going to put rust or if you're going to put oil on a model, be aware that it tends to come from like, you know, the places where your pipes are plugging into the model, you know, like, like very, uh, it, with orcs, it would come from like near joins if they're, if they oil the joints between their like armor plates and stuff like that. You just got to like, think about it. Even when it's a fictional thing, you could probably like figure out why or how you would have lubricant that would be leaking and it wouldn't be all over the flat surfaces of the model. So... So the moral of the story is really to kind of use your brain and uh, figure out, well, where does weathering actually occur? Like when you're doing bronze, weathering uh, corrosion is going to happen wherever water pools. Like on bronze statues, that usually means in like the little divots and creases and bits that are going to catch rainwater if it's a statue that's outside. And thinking about realism like that really helps your models. Even when you're just doing a gaming model, if you can do like a corrosion effect that looks really cool and, and real, uh, it makes your model like, you know, right away, like three times better and people will be wowed. Whereas if you just throw a bunch of rust all over the place, it... You know, maybe maybe people will realize that it's rusted, but they might be a bit more impressed if your rust actually looked like really real. Maybe not. Maybe people just look at anybody who tries an effect and thinks it's awesome. That's possible. The bottom line, guys, though, this is all my own opinions, and do what you like is always the underlying thing. Um, I'm a stickler for, I love realism in paint 
painting. I like to reach for it in my own work. I think that it definitely makes a difference in the quality of my work. Um, but you may not agree and you may not care. So if you don't care, you just subscribed with Prime. Did I totally miss it? I didn't see the sub alert go up. What does subscribing with Prime mean? Prime, you get a free, if you're, um, if you have Amazon Prime, then you get a free Prime sub. Every month you can assign your Prime sub to somebody sell it. Um, and you can change it every month because it, it'll, it'll expire and then you got to resubscribe, resubscribe. But you don't have to spend like money of your own to do it. It comes free with your Prime subscription. I was going to, I forgot I have to do the whole hand because it's all metal, all metal. So this is also blocking out where our metal is going to go. And this will actually um, let us uh, kind of think about colors on the model. Notice, by the way, that I'm not starting with the skin on this one. We were just talking to somebody on my other stream yesterday um, who asked if I was painted inside out, which is the term for starting like usually with the skin and then working outward. Um, and I don't, I mentioned to him that if I was working on a model that had a lot of metal on it, I would probably do the metal first. And here you go. Here's the example. I wasn't even thinking about that. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, what does subs do though? It actually gives us money, um, gives Reaper money to pay me and Justin and all the people in our Twitch department because Reaper, uh, has kind of compartmentalized our, our streaming division. So when we pay people like Luca and me um, and pay Justin to do all that video editing and all the over oversight that he does um, on the shows every day, um, that money comes directly from you guys as subs. So you actually help Reaper produce this content because Reaper, Reaper was doubtful of whether this would be worth it. And so we're essentially trying to prove to Reaper that it's worth it. So the more subs we get, the better. Yeah. So it actually doesn't just go into like the, the company's coffers. It actually is put back into paying the people who make this possible. So it's happy. It's good. All right. I missed a mold line, but I'm not going to. Well, maybe I'm going to care. Maybe I will care. I don't know. Don't you hate it when you miss a mold line? It always happens. The problem with bones is that you don't prime them, or at least I don't prime them. So I don't get the chance to like... Uh, put a primer coat on it and see the mold lines. I tend to only see the mold lines when I'm about to paint one, uh, which can be annoying. Come on, come on. Yay. Just gonna get in here real quick. Sorry, guys. Lots of prep. In in progress prep, right? Hashtag. Alrighty. So we we decided there was cloth in here, and it looks like there's two layers. It looks like he's got an inner padded shirt probably under this breastplate, and then he's got a another shirt under the outer armor. So we want to keep that in there, and we keep it not brown, so that we remember that it has to be a different color. But I'm going to paint over this little skull out on his, uh, his outside of his, uh, whatever you call it, I guess, arm grieve. I don't know. What's the term for the plate of armor that goes over your upper arm? I have no idea. There's bound to be vambrays. That's like armored hands, isn't it? I don't remember. I don't know my armor parts well as well as I should, apparently. Ah, vambrays. Okay, it was. Um, I don't think about insides of shields because I consider them the least interesting part of the entire model, Pendrake. Like, uh, almost without um, exception, I simply paint the inside of shields a dark color. Sometimes I will highlight it a bit, and then I move on. The inside of the shield is the least important, like, you, unless it's framing something, something important, the inside of the shield is completely not important. Like... There are some bu some busts that have shields on their backs, and in that case, the the inside of the shield is framing the head, in which case it becomes important. Um, but uh, yeah, he is he is carrying handcuffs right there.
but uh but you gotta um i mean yeah we could put some freehand in here we could put some wood grain or something um, but it's more likely it looks like uh leather on the outside so yeah it probably is wood or thin metal on the inside it looks like maybe wood with an, a line or a, like a, there's a like a maybe the leather is tacked down around it but it's kind of it hasn't taken the mold real good so we'd probably have to Oh, okay. Lower arm is, is okay. So rare, 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 reverence. I don't know. Up oh, and actually that is an artifact. I should not have kept that. I just realized that this little, um, this protuberance here actually isn't a part of this. It's actually, um, probably a, just kind of an artifact. So I'm going to take it out. I had left it because I was like, oh, maybe that's part of the thing. But I wasn't really looking at it. I was only trying to trim the mold line off the top of the shield. So do pay attention and see if some of this stuff makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, remove it. That's a great thing about plastic. Removing stuff is so easy. There. Boop. Get out of there. Sadly, you have to really kind of dig in to get this all out of here. And probably we won't be able to remove all of it without spending a serious amount of time on it, but I'll try. Trying to commit it from the side to trim it down. Got a little scuff over there, that's fine. Again, it's the interior of the shield, so it's not very important. It doesn't need to be perfect. But it's also going to bug me if I have a big chunk sitting here. So it's like this, uh, this like kind of compromise between how much time am I wasting on this and how much is it going to bug me if I don't do it, right? I think I think we all run into those moments on models. Yeah. All right. Almost good enough. All right. There we go. Uh, scrape off all these little irregularities all the little threads of plastic and then we can come back to it excellent much better when in doubt cut it out yep but like i said it really is that compromise between like how much does this annoy me and and how much how uh you know how much work is it going to be to remove it in the case of bones it's seldom a lot of work All right, now we can go down. There's a belt back there. I want to leave the belt a different color. I kind of want to look at the number of plates here. There's a plate, 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 and there's a plate, plate, plate. So this is not part of the belt. This underlying area is probably right in there. And I've, I'm not being real neat right now, guys, and I don't really need to be. Oh, there's a mold line on the freaking belt or freaking uh, pouch too. Ah, mold lines everywhere, everywhere I look. But anyway, you don't have to be super neat in this step because obviously you're painting against areas that you're going to paint over anyway. I'm going to take this mold line out. I didn't used to care about mold lines very much on these models because I was only like doing a couple of demos on each one and then they just get tossed in a box. But uh, now that I'm actually trying to like finish like do some of these guys to completion. I, I'm a little bit more painstaking when I discover a mold line that I completely miss the first time around. Hey, Robin. It's good to see you. 14 months. I haven't seen you uh, talk a, uh, in chat for a while. I wondered if you were still around. There's a few people who like popped up in the last couple days who I haven't seen in a while. Ah, ah. Man, okay. Tell me you're done. Tell me you're done, Minnie. Tell me there's no more mold lines to be had. The problem with armored figures is that, like, you can see the mold lines very, very clearly. Unless they put it along a seam. All right. Enough. Enough with you, dwarf. Blurg, 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 blurg. Oh, uh oh. Um, where's that cloth? That cloth is right there. Okay, I'd be careful. I don't want to paint over 
stuff that I think is uh, going to be covered up. That's not that's not metal, right? I don't. I know there's cloth here, and it kind of goes underneath these plates. Really, only a tiny fringe of it really shows at some points. So I need to make sure that I keep that um, not brown. And I went a little bit over. Um, Chibi Amy, Dark Dwarves. It depends on how we're going to paint it. Um, the Monster Manual has Dwargar as gray-skinned, purplish gray in the photo, or in the photo, in the uh, um, reference picture. Purplish gray, and then with a white beard. I have not yet decided. I kind of like the wow way to do it a little better. Um, no decision. All I know is that it's going to be lighter or brighter. We could make him look like a miniature fire giant, which actually is what I was thinking I might do, but it depends on how bright the copper goes. The red might not work. But uh, at this point, actually, guys, I am not thinking of any other colors on the model except, uh, hey, 20 Side TV, I'm doing well today. How about you? It's a very inefficient Friday. But other than that, inefficient does not mean bad. It just means mildly vexing. Uh, but yeah, I am going a step at a time on this model, so I'm not going to make or commit to any color choices yet. The reason is that, I learned this the hard way, when you do copper armor, don't even. Don't even make the decision. Because the copper orange is going to force you into decisions, and they may have nothing to do with your initial intention. Um, making a model orange really right away takes up one huge screaming block of color on your model. And copper is essentially orange. So from there, we need to make color choices. And I'm not going to pre-make a color choice because the last time I did a model with copper armor and made pre-made choices, I ended up repainting the hair on that model five times. <laughs> so no, we're not going to make that decision. <laughs> you, can, you can think about it if you like. But I have been burned too many times by copper armor. Yes, this is the dark base coat for the true metallics. I said I was going to do a model with metallics. So we are doing one. Oh yeah, this is actually um, black and brown 9137 magnetic. So, or no, that's scorched metal. Where's my black and brown? There it is. This, 9137 black and brown. You want a dark brown? for um, gold-toned or bronze-toned or copper-toned metallics in general. You can also use dark green or dark red, depending on what you're going for, but I tend to like to use neutrals and introduce any other colors via weathering techniques instead of uh, the underlying painting. The difference that doing a different color underneath your metallics makes is going to depend on the transparency of the metallics. If it's a very opaque metallic, then it doesn't matter at all. If it has some transparency, then you can suggest um, a slightly different color shift by going with a dark green, say, if you want to do something uh, copper but heavily verdigreed, and you're using a, a copper that, that is not like a solid, solid coverage, you can leave suggestions, have suggestions of that green kind of show through. But it depends on the paint line and the paint color you're using. So the best, as always, the best thing you can do is experiment. Play around. Alrighty, so we've got cloth. That's also cloth. This is a plate. At this point, we have to go a little bit careful just because we have to make sure that we're actually painting the things we want because the cloth actually goes up behind here. Up until we hit that, this looks like another plate. Triangular plate. And once again, we don't have to be too um, precise here, but we do not want to paint over things that are a different color. We want to keep these handcuffs out so we remember they're there. Yeah, it is a good base color for dark leather. I use it for that a lot. It's It really does look like really dark chocolate. Like it is the color of like 70% dark chocolate. And if I did not have the food rule i.e. do not name paints after food because children will be confused. Um, I would be, you know, I might have named it dark chocolate. So that is a very pretty color. It does have some red to it. 
because of the uh, pigments that go into it. So if I had to categorize it, it's not a true neutral brown, although it's so dark that it reads that way. But it does definitely favor um, being highlighted and mixed with reddish browns. as we block this in yeah it could be a good starting point i tend to use walnut go up with this and then maybe go up with the the highlight above that with intense brown a little bit but yeah it depends uh 20 sided tv this is black and brown i just uh just flashed it in front of the camera this one it is very very dark brown <laughs> yeah, there's uh, colors I violated that on, Reaper, Reaper John. Um, David has called me out on numerous ones as well. Cinnamon Red is all Dave's fault, though. Dave Dave created the color for that. Like, he, he created the name because I was looking for uh, names for red, and I was very vexed because I had used all the good ones. So I asked Dave, and it turns out that Reaper Dave is actually pretty good at naming paint. Another violation of your food rule. Yeah, that's what they were just talking about. They were taunting me with burgundy wine, John was. But yeah, in general, um, soon after that, I made the food rule. Like, I realized, like, lemon yellow is another case. You know, after the first uh, 54, I was getting a little bit more conscious of what I called things. And I was like, you know, I really have to not use a lot of food names. I don't want there to be confusion ever because you just don't know kids, right? Um, for, uh, for a bald eagle, yeah, I would probably use walnut and then this. I mean, this won't be much of a highlight because they're both so dark, but it'll give you kind of a gradual gradient. Then you'll have to kind of look at the highlight that I haven't looked at bald eagles recently, so I don't know. Um, I painted one a long, long time ago, but I don't remember what I used to highlight beyond that or how how much because their feathers are so dark their brown feathers are so dark i'm not sure how much of a highlight you actually get you'd have to look at photos and make that call and if you're painting a bald eagle you should be looking at photos anyway always always have photo references for your animals all right so we've got our belt going and that's not a belt i need to remember it looks like a belt this is a problem like this plate is a plate based on the position of this plate but the, the, uh, this makes it look like a belt. Cause the fact that the belt pouch is, is actually attached to the plate and not to the belt behind it. So it's kind of annoying, but. But that's all right. We can kind of suggest it by minimizing the top of that and maximizing the belt when we get to it. <laughs> you all, you only eat mermaids in season. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know where that came from and I'm like uh... <laughs> I'm gonna let you guys talk about mermaids and whether to eat them okay like we'll just leave that for you guys okay so it looks like there is a small plate on the front here that is a plate and not the cloth and that's what that is so I actually painted that correctly without even knowing it this is where it really pays to hope the sculptor sculpted symmetrically and also to constantly compare one side to the other. So over here, there is this little thing that comes down and over here we see that there is a plate that comes down. So, and it's different from the loincloth. So we want to factor that in. In reality, I could probably paint all of this, but as I get closer, I think I'm going to leave the boot I don't know. There's really needs to be a plate here. I think there was a plate definition there, except that the molding just didn't take. Let me see if it took on the other. Yeah, it took on the other side. See, there is a plate that comes down here. And on this side, it's just, um, it didn't fill. So we definitely do want to paint those plates then. So I'm going to put that line there and this stays boot colored and that's loincloth. So that's a plate. So all these plates. So it is a good thing that we're doing alternating because uh, it'll help us keep all this stuff separate. And uh, boy, there's all these plates. So many plates, everybody. He's like a lobster. Let's 
belly ears. Oh, mermaid scale is a food named paid. Only if you want to eat scales. Yuck. Yeah, general rule for me, eating sentient creatures is not a good thing. I agree, chibi. All right, we're going to just put on this. All these plates. Oh, dear. All right, I'm just going to block that in. If you see a little area and you're not sure what it is, you can feel free to block it in however you like. Usually I just go dark. Because if it's a little hollow like it was there, chances are it's just something behind something else and it would be in shadow anyway. He has a lot of metal on him. Are you getting that idea, guys? <laughs> Correct, Magnetic Gumby. Or, or even um, Stormy Gray would probably be even better. Or Carbon Gray. Because they're darker. But yeah, um, if you missed the start of the stream, Metallic Flakes these days, at least uh, the ones that Reaper purchases, and almost all, I would guess almost all water-based flakes, are formulated specifically to go over a dark color. They're, they're, they cover better and they shine more over a dark color. So if you are not putting a base coat under your Metallics and you're noticing that you're getting a lot of streaky effects that don't cover and look bad, that's why. Always put down... A layer of darker color underneath your metallics always 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 seriously they send us in the literature that comes with the flake the sales data they show you the effect of what the flake looks like over a coat of white and over a coat of black to kind of drum it into your head so this is why metallics that are intrinsically dark cover better like part of it is actual coverage from the black pigment and part of it is uh the fact that it just automatically gives you a back pigment, black pigment to uh, have the flakes reflect against. However, they tend to shine a little less because the black pigment also blocks some of the shininess by being in there. Essentially, the more pigment you load into a metallic paint, the less shiny it gets. That's why if you try to mix normal paints with metallic paints, you, you get what we used to call demi-metallics, which uh, still have shine but have less shine. They photo better because they're less shiny, but... They have less shine, so, you know. <sighs> dark dwarves, my dark dwarves are now officially lobster dwarves. Yeah, it's just the way it works. You're putting, when you put a more pigment into a metallic paint, you are putting particles in between the metal flake and the light. So the more particles you put in between the metal flake and the light, the more it will block the light. I mean, it's really, really, paint chemistry is so common sense, guys. It's so freaking common sense. When you get it down to the granular level, it's all just makes perfect sense. And you're like, oh, yeah. Um, uh, I don't know because glow in the dark paint is really see-through Bob and Julie. And so I almost would just use a really pale green, like maggot white almost maybe. Uh, if it's the green glow in the dark, I would just use a pale whitish green, like a spectral kind of white. Maggot white is a really good example. You could mix a little bit of like alien goo or dungeon slime into it. Cool, bearded nerd. I'm glad that they help. Yeah, I, I do go down to like the brass tacks on a lot of this stuff because I understand that there are a lot of newbies who are watching this show. Like there are a lot of old timers here who have been with me for, and heard me say this stuff a zillion times, but there are also a lot of new people. So it's never like, it's never a bad question. It, no matter how elementary you think it is, this, even though this stream is called Pro Tips, I do a lot of stuff for, for the people who are just getting back into the hobby or getting into the hobby for the first time. So yeah, yeah, I would probably use a pale yellow green. Um, when would you want to use flow improver versus wash medium to dilute? Uh, okay. So flow improver has one purpose. Actually flow improvers technically have two purposes. Um, and they usually, uh, go, they are usually leveraged towards one side or the other flow improver makes paint self level a little better and flow improver makes, um, uh, breaks surface tension. Both of these things can help with washes. However, remember that flow improver also, um, is already in the paint. So at some point, you know, you get diminishing returns. What I, when I thin with flow improver is if I have to do tiny details or freehand. 
that's when I use that. If I'm doing washes, then you want to use wash medium. But if you're doing a wash, you don't want to use flow improver. You want the wash medium because you want that extra medium in there to help your wash not break up. Flow improver is not going to keep your wash from breaking up. Oh, maggot white is no more? Oh, well then, um, three drops of pure white to one drop of dungeon slime, folks. And also I'm crying now because dungeon, because maggot white is no more. <laughs> yes, I'm good. I'm glad, to, glad you guys like the newbie tips because, you know, like I said, it, it never is a bad question. I mean, it's, it, like I said, it's it's the color that's closest to the glow-in-the-dark effect, so it's the color I would use to base coat. Glow-in-the-dark also is the same way, guys. It gives you diminishing returns if you add paint into it. Um, even more so, though, because then you're not only blocking the... You're not only blocking, like, the reflected light, you're, you're blocking the glow that's coming out, and you're blocking the UV coming in. So... You, when you add paint to any of this, uh, any, any, any paint that has a flake in it with a specific effect, when you add a normal opaque paint to it, you are automatically blocking part of that effect. So keep that in mind. I see little bits of stuff on the bottom of this beard and they're annoying me. Oh, what do we got? We have 10.40, so we've got about a half an hour left. Let's see here. Did I hit? Nope. Oh, I need to get the hammerhead. Then I need to ask myself if there's a... What color I'm going to make the outside of the shield. If I need to worry about it. So I need to start thinking about accent colors and where they're going to be. So once I've got all my metal kind of blocked in. I think I'm going to block in all of this. There are large dumpster noises outside my apartment. Please ignore. I don't know if my mic is picking up the big booms or not. My ears are picking them up, so it's always a chance. So I'm being, you know, I'm being fairly precise. The more precise you are at this stage, the less, the more work you're saving yourself later. If you want to be messy and fast, that's cool. You'll just make more work. You'll pay for it later. So either way... Painting with a precision is going to cost you time. It's just when you prefer to use that time. Some people want to just get the base coat on because it's the most boring part. And some people would like to keep it more precise to save themselves the go going back work later. We haven't gotten some of this. Is that a plate? That looks like it could be either cloth or a plate. Let's check the other side. Remember, we're checking. I think it's, an, I think it's not cloth. I think hmm, I could use it as cloth, though. So now I'm going to ask myself, what's going to give me more mileage? Making this a plate or keeping or keep or making it cloth. I could do either things with either with this, this irregular edge here. I kind of see a plate though. So I guess I should just make it a plate. It's a little bit too sharp, a little bit too sharp to be a cloth. So again, compare your miniature on both sides. I might be able to keep part of this as cloth, actually. Kind of want a little bit of accent color here and there. All right, so boots will probably be dark. They might even be black. I'll probably use a lighter color for the strap. I'm going to use a lighter color for this uh, belt. I need to do the back of the breastplate. People are talking. Silver dragonborn with silver armor when starting with a dark base coat. If you leave a little bit of it between the two, um, I mean, really probably the difference between the two as far as uh, skin and armor is going to be texture. Uh, it depends on the model, right? Um, but silver dragonborn and silver armor, you're just going to have a lot of uh, a hard time differentiating them unless you make them different colors, like different types of silver. And even then, that probably isn't going to look too great. So, because no contrast. 
So if I were you, I would just line or shade heavily between the skin and the armor. And yes, leaving that gray between the two will probably help with that. Let's see here. Yeah, it's what what Shadow Raven said, doing lining, like putting a dark line between the you, you definitely want to make a, a separation between like the armor and the face and, you know, between other parts and, and the scales. Um it that's a really yeah, it's a really hard call, um, when you have a metallic dragon dragonborn, um that's gonna be an armor. Because it it kind of it kind of screws you up a little bit. You could go. I mean, the way that I would do it if I was doing it is I would make the armor uh, actually a dark silver, like more of a darker steel color that just comes up really bright, and make the dragon's face much lighter, like a, a more of a true silver. Don't shade it as much. That way, you've still got your silver steel kind of all in white silver kind of thing, but you've got different. Um, different colors of silver or steel and that'll give you your contrast alrighty let's see we still have some plates man this guy has plates on top of plates on top of plates we are doing a lot of metallic well I wanted a model that was extremely metallic and I got one That and, in my opinion, these are some of the easiest types of plates to uh, paint. Like, I really like these kind of flared, um, layered plates, I think. It's hard to do a bad job on them as a new painter once you kind of, you know, get into it. Like either lighting, either lighting technique is going to enable you to, to make these look good, essentially. All right. So let's see. We've got the back of our boots. We're good. We got our cloth. That's good. Uh, that's a belt. This is, uh, this is a diamond shaped plate in the small of his back. Boy, that's going to hurt if you bend back too much. This is Anne, always thinking about back pain. <laughs> and so we've got some holes in there through those links. So I'm putting those shadows in there. I just noticed a little piece of plastic that's sticking in here that I have to grab. There it is. Okay, so we've got belt. There's the edge of that plate. Probably do these chains in silver or steel for contrast. Hmm. All right. If we want to, we can use this color to line a bit. Though I won't waste too much time on that. Just going to give my brown a chance to dry. And yes, if I'm going to make these manacles um, steel or silver, I am going to paint them gray first. Yes, I am blocking off all the areas that I'm going to get hit with either scorched metal or copper. And I've uh, kind of trying to decide if I want to use coppery orange or dwarven gold for my copper. They're very similar. They use a very different flake, though. 
I may um, put them both into the palette and uh, highlight, mix my highlight color and see which one looks better. Yeah, there is a, a lot of little nicks in the leather here. And since it's leather, we can make it a different color, an accent color. Um, we haven't yet decided what sort of accent colors you're going to use on this guy. So we're keeping it kind of blank. One thing I am going to do is I am going to paint the inside of this. Even though we're not there yet. This is going to be dark. Because the inside of a shield is, like I said, never important. Put some details on it if you want to, if you find that it's making a big boring space on your mini, but be very careful when you do that. You want to make your details subtle. You don't want to distract from the model itself. So even when I do something like put a wood grain, wood grain in the background, I keep it low key. I don't make it like really stand out because it's not a very important part of the model. It's different if, like, the back of the shield is used to frame something. As I said earlier, there are models that have, like, a shield on their back where the interior of the shield frames the face. Um, there are also models, we were talking yesterday about having, um, like, prayer scrolls on the back of a big shield. So if you have a paladin with a shield next to him and you can see the interior and it's going to be painted that way, then that makes sense to add a little detail on there. But always be conscious that when you do freehand, you're attracting the eye. And if, uh, if you are doing a lot of freehand on something here, you're going to be distracting from the dwarf himself. So. Oh dear, bug lips. Yes, I know. Autocorrect. It's out to get you today. All right. So we appear to be good. We've got our cloth areas. We've got our inner sleeve, our, our, our inner sleeve and our outer sleeve, which is probably a padded jerkin. We've got our belts kept mostly clear. We've got our pouches that are going to come off the belts kept clear. We've got our little cloth part down here, the handle. What this is giving us, guys, is a map of where our accent colors can be. All right. So right now potential accent colors if this is a leather wrapped shield and the and the leather is being wrapped around the other side here then this edge we have two colors here that we can use we've got our leather we've got a color down here we can use we can paint the um, hammer handle a different accent color if we want and we have a potential hair accent here if we want to use it so that's where I'm starting to think. I haven't started thinking about real colors right now, but I'm thinking about breaking down the model into where do I have opportunities to add color? And this is an important question to ask yourself when you are working on a model that is, uh, oh, and there's a strap there too. Like this is actually, that's a strap. So I'm only going to have one accent color here unless I make that strap really narrow. It does look like there's two layers. Like there's the cloth and then there's the strap. Kind of. It's a little mucky. When you've got detail that kind of globs together like this, it can be very difficult. And sometimes you have to just create a separation line with your paint so that you get the strap, but you also get the sleeve so you can have that accent color in there. When a model is full of armor, there are very few opportunities to introduce an accent color. And the rule with accent colors is you want to repeat them over the course of the model. So you have to kind of keep in mind, or you should keep in mind, it may make it easier for you in the beginning to keep in mind, okay, what spaces do I have open where I haven't assigned a color yet? And I can utilize those then to put an accent on. Ah, thanks for the prime sub, Cthulhu Keeper. Yay. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much for the sub. We like subs here. It helps keep the lights on. And it helps keep the light lights on in, in Reaper's Twitch department. All right. So I'm going to just take a little bit of time just because I have this brown, which is nice and dark. I can separate out these areas. Oh, and I forgot that this, uh, this end here is probably also copper, but I may not want it to be copper. I may have to stop and think about that. I may want to make the hammer silver. And I just realized it because this is up against that. So I have an item that is separate up against the armor that I'm planning to paint copper. So now I'm really questioning whether I want this to be copper or not. 
because normally it would be the same color here and here. And then I would be putting copper up against copper. It'd be very hard to see the details here. So I may change my mind. This is how mapping this out is helping me. Then I'm like, oh, okay, I have this and I forgot it. So that means I probably should make this the same silver steel that I'm making this. And that means that I should make the hammerhead the same color. So go sub in a corner now. Yes, go sub in a corner. Pop some water into my brown. So blocking in stuff like this and looking at what you've got left is a good way to spot problems before you are like committed. Like I would have started painting this hammer copper and then I would have come up against this little nubbin and gone, oh no. So I have a lot of stuff in my way. Alrighty. So instead we're going to keep this little nubbin, um, oh, the, the gray color to tell us that it's not going to be metal of that particular color. Got a sleeve back here we got to deal with. A little bit of plate coming down. There. All right, so now we've got boots, straps, cloth, belt, cloth. Haven't decided on the shield color yet. Haven't decided if we're even going to do copper on these little guys, although we probably will, but maybe not. Maybe not. Um, everything else looks like it is adequate. I'm going to keep the hammerhead this color, but I'm going to try to remind myself. All right, now we're going to put down our scorched metal. And we're going to make a decision about where we want it. We've already made our key decision. When you're working on layered armor and you're alternating plates, you need to start somewhere. I'm going to start with the breastplate. Breastplate's going to go dark. That means as I work outward, I'm going to be going light with everything right next to it, and then dark, and then light, and so on, alternating. Uh, if I come to a place where I'm like, oh, I should alternate and make this dark, but I really want it to be light, I may switch it up. It depends on what's next to it. Um, the shield is very evidently leather, Shadow Raven. At least it looks leather. It's done as if it were leather. Like it's got creases in it, um, nicks. Uh, it's got like it's got um, rivets pegging it on uh, to the frame, which usually does not happen with a full metal shield. And if we do that, then we've locked in. If we essentially make the shield metal, we've destroyed our opportunity to use another accent color. Like then the model becomes like all different kinds of metal, which can be can be fine. But if you like colors, then you've just killed your chance to make this a bright color, like a red or a purple or something. Yeah, I mean, I was going purely from what I was seeing with the detailing on the shield, which is actually quite nice. You can see that little bit of a crease there. Um, but, uh, I mean, the other option is if you paint this metal, you have destroyed your opportunity to paint it a color. Which may be okay with you. But for me, I'm looking at this cloth down here and this cloth here. I'm going to need something to balance these accent colors, right? Because I'm going to have an accent color there. I'm going to have an accent color here. That means I'm probably going to want an accent color here. Because remember, accent colors should come in uneven numbers, ideally. So this would be three. And they're in great positions to offset each other. So for an accent color to be here and then here and then here, it moves your eye around the figure. Key. So keep that in mind. Um, in our uh, uh, ask it here and I will answer it. I don't have the time for forums um, these days. Like I, I really don't. I've got a lot of video stuff I need to do today. So if you ask it here, I can tell you and you can just go back and answer it or somebody can. But yeah, I've got so much. I have to get back on my own Discord and, and get on there. Heraldic rules, you can't do metal upon metal. Well, that's her heraldry. And we don't know. We don't know if these guys follow that. Uh, where else do I want to do? Do I want to block in the face? No, I'm not going to touch the face yet. Oh, okay. Yeah, if they're on the stream, awesome. Can always ask here. Yeah, I just, uh, I seriously just don't have the time anymore. Forums suck up a lot of time. Like, um, just like emails do, right? Because it takes time to write a response, takes time to think about it. 
it takes time to go there and then you get distracted by other questions because you're like, well, I'm here. I should, you know, spend more time here. Um, so I just, I don't do it anymore. I've got a lot of different places people can ask me paint questions. I mean, this stream and my own stream and my Patreon. Um, so yeah, we're good. My back is acting up a little, guys, so I think I'm going to call this really quick. We won't actually get... We won't actually get our medals down. Well, okay, maybe we'll try to do a little bit of scorch metal. But my back is starting to ache a little bit, so I want to watch it. It's, uh, it's a slow build to get my back back up. All right, so actually, let's do a... This, this particular metal covers really well. Let me show you how well scorched metal covers. Like, really solid. So this is Scorch Metal 9125. It's a beautiful dark copper color. If you um, if you like a color called Tin Bits by Games Workshop of old, this is kind of a similar color. Um, this color is actually the color you get in real armoring when you uh, put linseed oil over armor and then heat it to kind of bake in a, a coat of sealing that helps protect against rust. Um I was actually in a sh in an armorer shop once, and he had a uh, like a shoulder plate that he had coated with linseed oil and then baked it on, and it was exactly this color. And I'm like, that's where that color comes from. Yeah, this is tin bits. So there you go, Crowley. So let's see here. <laughs> I don't see that question about the black yet. I'm kind of keeping an eye out, but... All right, so then we can put it over our scorched metal. I don't want to get it too thick, because remember, this is one of those metallics can be thicker as far as globbing in detail and stuff like that, and that's just because the flake is larger than your usual paint particles, which, if you think about it, makes sense. It's an actual flake, so... Then we've got that shiny dark copper. Um, very little Agent Marvel because when you do, the flake is so heavy that when you add water, it will sink. It's heavier than the water. It is uh, held in suspension by the resins in the, in the base. So if you're going to thin it, thin it just a tiny little bit. So I'd say six to one. So like six drops of metallic, one drop of water, you can probably get away with that. Shiny. So it's a nice dark, dark copper bronze. Chalky. Old yellowish glossy label. Oh. So wait, he has the old, old, he has an old, old bottle. Um, uh, That's just going to be age. Like that bottle is 15 years old. Seriously. What he's probably got is a chemical reaction due to aging because we have changed like the, the first batch of black is not our current black. Like we ended up changing the base several years in. So uh, um, I don't have old tin bits, Crowley, but um, I, I based this color directly on Games Workshop's tin bits. Like it's almost identical. Down to the down to the shift of purple in the base. Yeah, so if you, one of you guys has a pro, has a has a response for him, let him know that if he has the original glossy labels, though that is that paint is fifteen years old. It's it's way beyond its warranty. Um, some of our I I believe that our current bases are stable enough to last for that and beyond. But when we started Master Series, there were bases we had to discontinue because we weren't getting optimal effects with, and also bases that went out of print. Um, there was all this sort of thing, right? And so whenever you launch a new paint line, Ed will talk about this from time to time, there are bugs to be worked out because you don't know how the product's going to age necessarily in this new application. You don't know it, how you're, there may be bugs in your chemistry that you're not aware of. You know, it's a learning experience when you start a new product curve. So that's a very, very old bottle. And uh, if I had to guess, I would guess maybe a little bit of chemical instability that's allowing the matting agent to come to the fore a little bit too much. If he's been using it all these years, then my guess is he hasn't been shaking it up enough and the matting agent has now exceeded, as far as ratio, it's exceeded what it should be in the base, so it's getting frosty. 
that's two possibilities. Uh, either way, um, spend three fifty on a new bottle. <laughs> yeah, I mean that really is it. That's an ancient bottle of paint. Like some paints, uh, no paints are generally not like wine, Asian marble, because you there's there's oxygen the oxygen that leaches into the wine bottle like makes the wine get more complexity. Whereas the wa the air that that leaches into a paint bottle just makes paint dry out and get weird. Yeah, but I mean, it depends kind of on his circumstance. Like I said, if he's been using that black all these years, but he hasn't shaken it very well, matting agent do is one of the things that will settle out, out over time. And so that's po it's possible it would be weird to see it happen but that old black base like it, it was like i said it was very different black base um from what we use now so okay so we're getting a little bit so now guys if we're alternating that means that this top plate is going to be my base my base copper color whatever we decide to do next time um and then we're going to do another plate a kind of separating plate in our scorched metal and then the lower plate there will be orange, uh, will be an orange again. So you see, I kind of have that metal on. You'll be able to see the scorched metal a lot better once we get some highlights on it. It is a very dark metallic and it, and it's hard to see when the light isn't hitting it. See, you can see it right there. But putting this dark brown down gives us a much more even coat. You can see it's not streaky at all. Gives it a good bright sheen. Thanks, bug lips. Yeah, let's get a raid. My back is tired. It needs a rest. But at least we got to the point where we're like ready to totally dive in on our metallics next time. We'll uh, we'll experiment with our coppery orange and dwarven gold, and we'll decide which of them actually makes a better copper when we mix in some highlights. We did talk a lot about a lot of technical information about metallics and why you work with them this way. A little bit also of color composition as far as planning your accent colors in advance to figure out where they're going to be um, and stuff like that. So yeah. Hopefully, uh, we did cover a lot of quality information today. So hopefully you guys had Got fun. Got us a raid. Hmm? We're raiding miniatures, Dan. Okay, say hi to Luca, everybody, and I'll see you all on uh, Monday. All right, Monday morning. Have a good one. Thank you guys very much. Don't forget, uh, today we have Reaperland at 3. Well, kind of Reaperland. It's uh, John and I are doing another fun like community show where we experiment with stuff and play Vigi games as it were and uh we'll, we'll we'll have some fun with it guys come come hang out it's really a feel good friday that's really laid back so come check it out and then uh later after that i believe we have bones five live so it may not be a very long episode because uh we are in those doldrums where there's not a whole lot to talk about but we will talk about stuff um so join us for the rest of our programming today guys thank you very much <laughs>